All right, welcome back. <clears throat> this is the third video where I specifically set up the way we're going to value the cash flows. And I titled this, and for how long? Uh, in the first of the videos, two videos ago, I talked about the value of an asset or the value of a company, the value of a stock is based on these uh, set of metrics, these variables that boil down to cash flow. And cash flow has three subcomponents, duration, magnitude, and growth. And then for the discounting part, we deal with both uncertainty and the time value of money. In the first of the lectures, I talked about the time value of money and the role uncertainty plays. Then in the second uh, lecture on, on specifically valuation, we talked about uh, the cash flow you wanted to discount. So I introduced and defined NOPAT, net operating profit after taxes. Today, we're going to deal with uh, essentially the duration for how long. And then in the next video, I'll set up the issue, the challenge of growth. All right. So the fundamental value of an asset, the fundamental value of a stock is the present value. We know this to be true is the present value of all future free cash flows that the asset generates discounted back for time and uncertainty. I keep coming back to that time and uncertainty, not time and risk. We'll talk about uncertainty and risk in a future video. And so in the first week, we really talked about how you want to think about the discount rate. That's that R. And I walked you through the interest rate stack where you really want to think about opportunity cost of the money, the inflation impact of the money, and then the uncertainty of future cash flows. Equities are different than credit instruments. Credit instruments are often legally uh, binding. You have a preset amount of money. It's uh, part of the contract, contractual amount. In equities, it's an unknown. And it's also a residual cash flow. So you definitely don't know what that cash flow will be. And as a consequence, you have to discount back for uncertainty. Um, and then the second lecture, we really talked about what free cash flow. So for me, no PAT, that net operating profit after tax, it's essentially a no growth estimate of free cash flow. We don't talk about changes in the balance sheet. And then we also talk about an unlevered cash flow, capital structure neutral. And my philosophy is that you want to value the cash flows first and foremost, and then you can do financial and engineering or leverage on top of that. Today, what I really want to talk about is the duration of the payments. Um, uh, we, we've talked about it. how you're I mean, the discount rate. We talked about the type of, of cash flows. And now I want to the, the, the real question is for how long, essentially. So for how long now, when you look at the equation, it is the present value of all future cash flows, all future cash flows. So when we talk about it, we say, you know, for how long? Forever. And that is one of the two big challenges of using a DCF is we have to discount back all of the cash flows, not just a period of those cash flows. The second component, which I'll talk about and then I'll set up in the next lecture is really the challenge of dealing with growth. Um, that's a separate lecture and very important. So we want to think about is all the cash flows, but that's hard to think about. All right. So in finance, uh, particularly in academic finance and in theory, we have come up with practical approaches for dealing with time. And it, they all generally are the same, which is you have a DCF, discounted cash flow model, with an explicit forecast period plus a terminal value, explicit forecast period will be the period that you build out a very detailed model um, with a detail, detailed P&L. You're going to look at other uses and sources of cash and things like that. You're going to look at margin sensitivity, profitability, um, reinvestment and things like that. Very detailed, um, multiple lines, uh, multiple tabs in a spreadsheet. And then a terminal value will be the value of the cash flows beyond the explicit forecast period. All right, so this is what it generally looks like, right? At the top, the, the fundamental value of a stock is the present value of all future cash flows discounted back for time and, I'm hoping you say uncertainty. And then they break this in, um, the practical approaches, we break it into two components. The first one is the explicit forecast period. In this example, I'm using a five-year explicit 
So it's year one, two, three, four, and year five. And then the terminal value, which are the cash flows beyond year five. And this is the standard setup. And I dare say, there would be exceptions, I dare say that in most uh, training, whether it's um, in the real world or in school, undergrad or grad, they use a five-year explicit forecast period, which means they go through a fair amount of detail, build out a detailed model for five years, and then have a terminal value for all cash flows beyond the fifth year. Remember, we need all of the cash flows. So there's a lot of cash flow beyond year five. So we have a very detailed model for five years and then all of the rest of the cash flows, the value of those cash flows beyond year five are placed in a terminal value. And one of the first questions I always ask in my class, and I rarely get a good answer is why five years? Why is the explicit forecast period, most of the examples, five years? I will get answers. They're just not very good answers. Um, my answer is because there's five fingers on a hand, which usually elicits a few snickers from the students. But the, the other answers aren't much better, frankly. Um, one one uh, reason you'll hear a lot is, well, um, that's a business cycle. But it's not true anymore. Business cycles aren't five years. I'm not sure they ever were, but they're certainly not now. So that's not a very good one. The answer you almost always get is that forecasting beyond year five is uncertain. And I find this answer pathetically weak because forecasting year five isn't that easy. But somehow forecasting year six and seven is that much harder that you're unwilling to do it. It's just the, the answer collapses in its own logic. I mean, it's ridiculous. We do five because we do five. Now, I could live with that if, in fact, that explicit forecast, the five years, that cash flow amounted to the majority of the valuation of the company. But as any of you that have done a DCF, you know that's not true. So why not seven or 10? I don't, I don't know. Not a good answer. All right. Now, the practical challenge, the practical approach of dealing with the terminal value is generally uh, a formula. It looks something like this. We take the notepad in year six. We capitalize that. We assume it lasts forever. And then we discount that back for time and uncertainty for those six years. It usually works that way. And you'll get formulas that are called the perpetuity growth formula. I'm actually going to use that in a minute. The Gordon growth model, which takes growth into account or no growth perpetuity. So um, it, it's uh, formulaic based, which is fine. But now I have two components of my valuation, the explicit period and the terminal value. So let's go look at the practical implication. All, all of these approaches have the same flaw. And that is the terminal value is I almost always greater than 70% of your present value. So I want to walk you through the implication. If we use a formula-based approach to terminal value, we're going to, we're going to get 70% of our calculated value is going to be in the terminal value. The problem is the terminal value is highly sensitive to uh, the assumptions we make. Move the assumptions around a little bit and that terminal value will swing around like the often referred to as the tail on a fish. Um, drop your discount rate by half a percentage point and the value will go up by a lot. Increase your margins a little bit uh, and your valuation will go uh, changes a lot. If you're using perpetual growth uh, formula, change your growth rate by half a percentage point and your valuation will change by a lot. So number one, the terminal value is 70 percent of the calculated value. And number two, it's highly sensitive to our input assumptions that should cause you some concern. Uh, and I, I think it's really important. All right. Now, I'm going to ask a more fundamental question. Remember, what we're trying to do is find the value of those cash flows today. All we have done is shift the problem into an explicit, which might have some value. That model may inform us a lot about the company. But then we're going to put the rest of the value, that terminal value, into a formula. Why not just use that formula today? Now, if the terminal value was 10%, 15%, 20%, I could understand the benefits of doing a explicit forecast period because I'm going to find 90 95% of the value. But it's not true. Uh, no matter how detailed my explicit forecast model is, 
I'm only going to get maybe 30% of the value, estimated value. That means that I'm putting an enormous amount of work onto one of these formulas. Well, to get a 30% confidence in the, in the valuation for all that work, I don't know if it's worth it. So I often think, what's the difference between present value at time t equals zero? That's that first part of the first part of the yellow comet versus the terminal value at time five. So I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not even sure this has a whole lot of merit. Now, we've got to keep, we, we certainly have to replace it if we're going to remove it from the toolkit. All right. Now, one of the things that's really important, because I hear this a lot from practitioners and students. Well, Paul, I understand that my, my explicit forecast is only 30%. I'm not that comfortable forecasting beyond year five. Um, there's too much uncertainty. And it's happening to say, well, wait a minute. All of those terminal value formulas that you're using have an explicit forecast of forever. You already are forecasting forever. You're not doing an explicit forecast forever. You're doing something worse. You're coming up with a very simple formula to calculate the value forever. The other thing is if you're using a multiple of any kind, a PE multiple, even price to revenue, EBITDA multiple, which we talked about last video, that the implied forecast period there is also for forever. So this idea that, oh, I'm not comfortable forecasting for forever or even beyond year five, you are, and you're doing it in a very crude way, crude in the sense of imprecise. All right, so this is uh, a visual DCF. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I'm going to I'm going to build this up over the next couple of lectures, um, but this is effectively a visual DCF. It's got a 25 year explicit forecast. It has a zero terminal value, and then each of these slices are the present value of the cash flow in that year. So if you look at year 12, that slice is the current present value of. Uh, of the of the forecasted cash flow in year 12. That's not the year 12 cash flow. That's the present value of that cash flow. And that's why I call this a visual DCF. And if I add up all of those cash flows, present value slices, I get the enterprise value of the company. So this is why I call it a visual DCF. We're going to use this tool a lot in future videos. All right. So now if we use this chart, this is just the annual cash flows, the present value of those cash flows. If I use, if I create a cumulative present value of notepad, that's just take uh, year one, then add year two, then add year three and get a cumulative. Then in my 25 years, I get to 100% of the value, which makes sense, right? In year one, I have a uh, dollar based on 20. I think I have less than 5%. Um, and then by the end, I've added them all up. I have 100%. All right. This is a traditional DCF. Uh, I uh, go out five years for my explicit. Uh, and then that works out in this example, it works out to about 23 and a half percent of the total value. Or in other words, the, the non-explicit, the terminal value is 76 percent. All right. So if we go back to our visual DCF here, each of these slices, and I now look at it, I have the explicit is the dark blue on the left. The terminal value is the gray. If you just look at it visually, you realize that your estimate of the terminal value is significantly, in this case, three times more important than the blue. So the blue may give you some insight into the business, but it's not helping you with evaluation. The terminal value in this case is clearly significantly, in this example, three times more important in calculating the present value of those cash flows than the explicit. I think this visual is very helpful. All right, now let's go to an 18-year explicit. And I did this because that's how I get to 85% of the present value. And I think anything less than 85%, I'm putting way too much of the value, calculated value in the terminal value. I have to go to 18 years to get to 80, 85%. In this case, it's 86%. And this is what it looks visually. And here, even still, I have 15% on my value in that terminal value. So what you'll see I'm going to do, not in this lecture, but over time I'm going to do is we're going to use a 25 year explicit and I'll explain to you how I got there and why. And then we'll have a visual tool to look at the impact on the company's value, depending on your assumptions on 
on, on growth and a few other things. All right. I had a student and did a summer project and I asked him to go calculate the, um, explicit forecast period as a percent of the valuation. So the blue is the explicit, the orange is the terminal value. When he used a five-year explicit, he got, this is for Diageo, he got 88% of the terminal value. And when he went to 20 years, he still had 59% of the value in the terminal value. I thought that was fascinating. Brown Foreman, even worse, after a 20-year forecast, he still had 69% of the value beyond the forecast period. Pretty amazing. And then Constellation Brands, 42%. So you just see that even pushing the forecast period out, you may not capture full value. Uh, stocks look long term, a theme I'm going to come back more than once, I promise. All right, so we've got to go to a tw- in this model, the one I'm going to use, you have to use a 25 year explicit forecast period to get to 100% of the present value in the um, explicit, not in the terminal value. Now, a lot of people are going to say, Paul, I'm not comfortable with a 25 year explicit forecast period. I understand that, that I, I get that intuitively. But keep in mind that every valuation method you've used up to this point has an explicit forecast period way beyond 25 years. I'm not asking you to do anything you're not currently doing. What I'm asking you to do is, and this is key, be explicit about your assumptions rather than implicit. If we can push that terminal value to zero, then we know what our assumptions are on profitability and growth. And that's what I want to tease out. Um, starting with the next lecture. So that's the key. It's not that I think somehow magic you can forecast out 25 years. I'm just saying let's get rid of the terminal value because that's not helping us in our valuation. There's too many crude assumptions, rough assumptions in the terminal value to be comfortable with DCF. And that's why DCF is not used much on Wall Street because all practitioners know changing your assumptions on that terminal value, those inputs, change the valuation dramatically. And so they don't have comfort on a DCF valuation. I'm going to invert the tool in a minute. We're going to effectively do a minute, a couple of videos and do a reverse DCF. And I'll show you a very pragmatic way where you can use the logic of a DCF to estimate value. I think it's pretty cool, but this has really been the setup for that. All right. And that's what it's going to look like. You'll see this model again. As I said, in future videos, I'll build up this chart so you can see where it comes from. I think it's a very good visual aid because all of the assumptions related to valuation are displayed in this chart. All right, the last comment I will make, I just want to uh, really hit home on this, is that if you're using a traditional uh, DCF, five-year explicit, seven-year explicit, and a terminal value, you really have to ask yourself the confidence you have in the data uh, you may have a lot of confidence in your explicit because you've done a ton of work on, uh, on revenue growth and profitability, return capital, but you cannot, cannot have much confidence in the terminal value because you're making very rough, crude assumptions related to it. So now if we mix those together, something with a high degree of confidence, your explicit forecast period, with something you have incredibly low confidence in the value of the data, you end up with, guess what? a mixture of bad with good, but the bad overrides the good by a lot. So that's why you really can't use a DCF the way it's taught um, in stock valuations, why most money managers have very little respect for it. I'm going to play with the tool a little bit and then give you what I think are some insights where we can go back to the, the value of the DCF without its limitations. Um, that's where we're headed with our videos. All right. Would be at an impasse. But I think I can come up with a breakthrough. All right. Thank you again for watching.